you have more than 20 years of experience as a sports coach. What's it like? It's one is they play sports and the other one is building organizations, building teams. Sport challenge or business challenge are the same. It's all about people, it's all about humans. The, the biggest challenge I can see and share from my personal experience is how to make all teams work together. So the technique to glue one team, 15 individuals is one thing, or to glue entities is something else. It's the same as how can we glue countries, how can we create merge and acquisition that two companies are working together. What's the experience like training, coaching people in Vietnam the last eight years that we've had? Here everything is there in-house. You have all pieces of the puzzle, but it's a little bit chaotic. How to better manage the pieces of the puzzle? Right. Only 100 companies in Vietnam, they make up 25% of wow. GDP. Coaching many family business today, I know that humility, openness and letting the successor make it his own way, with his own talent, or his own magic, is, that's really the challenge. Not many that I met and interviewed, they believe much into getting experts from outside and teaching us what to do. Training outside in, coaching inside out. What is your potential and how can we really upload your genius to make your genius and your potential and your talent more effective? That's coaching and that's new for Vietnam. Welcome to Forbes CEO Talks. Uh, I am your host, Kung Dang. And today our special guest is a gentleman traveling all the way from Belgium, Alain Goodsman. And Alain is a world-renowned expert in the field of mental coaching, with more than 20 years of experience as a sport coach for many Olympic athletes, especially the Belgian Olympic teams. He is the founder and CEO of Mentally Fit Institute, an organization which stems from the philosophies of sports coaching, He's worked with many well-respected global companies such as IBM, Air France, Adidas, Heineken, just to name a few. Mr. Goodsman, good to have you here. Thank you for being here. Nice to be here. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine, really. Every time I join Vietnam, I feel good because I see, I feel the energy. I think energy is key. We need that energy, could be the mental energy, physical energy, emotional energy, but there is energy in Vietnam, much more than in some other regions much more entrepreneurship, people, the willingness is there. So I feel good when I join you. That's, that's exciting. So you, you've been in, involved in doing business in Vietnam uh, for quite some time. Oh, yeah, and I started uh, coaching in Vietnam in 2015. I was uh, invited by Heineken, Heineken Vietnam, which is uh, one of the biggest entity of Heineken Global. So uh, Heineken Vietnam is really a high-performing team, high-performing company. and. Uh, I, had, I did to conduct many missions for Heineken Global and they proposed me to join Vietnam and I did coach the Vietnam team in 2015, 16, 17, 18, till the pandemic. And uh, at that moment I really was impressed by the, the willingness, the engagement of the Vietnam teams. And that was really for me a very impacting. So today, uh, six, seven years later, I feel more energy than then in 2015, I see that the, the country is expanding, more entrepreneurs, more projects, more development. This is really an, a real emerging country. It, it is an exciting uh, time to be in Vietnam, despite the global uh, current economic landscape, but still Vietnam is certainly on the rise and, and have a lot of eyes on it. Before we talk more on the, the coaching side and the energy, the experience with many companies that you've done business with, let's talk about, uh, a bit about your background. You have more than 20 years of experience as a sports coach. So I assume you were an athlete yourself in the past. What was it like? What sport did you play? My, my background is tennis. I was a tennis player. I started as a tennis professional player playing in Belgium, in Europe. But uh, after five, six years of trying to, to reach the top at the ATP in the, what is the 70s, in the 80s, I was not good enough. And then I moved into coaching. And the Belgian Tennis Federation recruited me for coaching and I was coaching uh, young athletes, 14, under 14, under 16, under 18. And honestly, I was a better coach than player. <laughs> <laughs> I had more talent in detecting, detecting your talent, in developing your talent than in producing my own talent on the pitch. So my talent probably was coaching. And uh, for 20 years, I did coach uh, tennis players all around the world 
on the mental side of the game. Because when you, when you look at the top players today, Roger Federer, Novak Djokovic, Nadal, they are all technically fit, they are all physically fit. The mind makes a difference. The intelligence of the game, the choices, the tactical choices, mainly also the managing feelings and emotions. It's there that you make the difference. With those successful Olympians, athletes that you trained and uh, coached, transitioning that into uh, what today is mentally fit, you, you started working more with leaders and executives around the world. What's it like? You, it's one is they play sports and the other one is just building organizations, building teams, uh, accomplishing goals themselves. Can you share more about yeah, it's all about it's all about performance. In sport and in business is how to how to perform, how to perform individually or how to perform collectively. The difference is that in, in business is more collect, collective performance. Sport is divided in two parts, individual performance, individual sport and collective sport. Business is mainly a collective performance. So that teamwork mindset, solidarity, working together the feeling of belonging to a team is something that we need to develop in the corporations. So I moved from sport to corporation 20 years ago, coaching individual coaching for top managers, but also collective coaching, team coaching for the, for the managers, the teams. And coaching teams today I see in Vietnam is key. Coaching individuals is important, but coaching teams, how to glue the team, how to make that a selection of super experts, finance, marketing, HR, logistics, supply chain, sales are playing together. It's the same challenge in sport. You select the best players of your country, how to create the glue, how to make the glue that they play together. So sport challenge or business challenge are the same. It's all about people. It's all about humans. I run Forbes in Vietnam and as many leaders and audience here, the executives, I listen. The, the biggest challenge I can see and share from my personal experience is how to make all teams work together. In, in teams, not just one team, but across teams. That in finance and marketing and sales, let's just say, sales has to go meet the target, but marketing has the support in terms of brand reputation. And then operation needs to deliver. You can control yourself. You can try to figure out a system for yourself. And then you try to influence the sets of leaders but then to make them work together is quite challenging in my experience. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I like your definition of uh, leadership, which is leadership is creating positive energy. In the past, leadership was guidance, direction, showing the way, uh, connecting people. It was all about uh, setting the rules, making decisions. Today, the foundation of leadership is really, do we create energy? Do we energize the teams? Do we energize the company? And based on that common energy, then it's how to connect the teams. And that's all about inter-teams connection. There are two dimensions in high-performing teams. Me, my team, how can I glue my players? And then the second dimension, how can we glue different teams playing together? We have one team here, one team, and we have another team. How can we glue the two teams? So the technique to glue one team, 15 individuals is one thing, how to glue entities is something else. It's the same as how can we glue countries, how can we glue, how can we create merge and acquisition that two companies are working together. So the three elements of the glue for inter-teams glue are first common interest. We need to find a common interest. It's not the same goal, but common interest. In Europe, Europe is based on 25 countries. 25 countries, what is our common interest, economic interest, financial interest, to work together. The second is shared values. The third one is mutual trust. So those are the three ingredients. So when you want to sign a partnership, check what is the common interest, what are the, common, the shared values, and what could be the third one, which is really we trust each other, means transparency. Transparency is key. It's the, the concept of full, full visibility. Transparency is killing trust, but the three elements are important. By example, so inter-teams connection is key, so we have to create what we call a team deal. Team deal is what do you expect from them and what they expect from you, and we clarify the team deal. A team deal means that what do you expect from this company, this entity, this team, and what do you expect from the other team? By example, marketing and sales. Marketing and sales, you put the two teams together and you organize a team deal. 
what marketing is expecting from sales, what sales is expecting from marketing. When you clarify mutual expectations, you glue the team. What is gluing multiple teams is the common interest, the shared values, and the mutual trust. So those are the three ingredients that you have to check. On, on the trust um, aspect, you've been here since 2015, and um, you coached people around the world, Heineken, IBM, and, and Shell, and other companies. Let's talk about Vietnam for a second. What's the experience like training, coaching people in Vietnam the last eight years of being here? So my experience today in Vietnam, when we refer to the key elements of building a high-performing team, working together, the advantage of Vietnam is that you decided that we all people come back to work and we, we, we promote office working. Online working is killing the physically together. I you, was in you're a, against hybrid. <laughs> I'm not against hybrid. I just say, and I was in, uh, in, uh, in the United States last week, that excess of home working disconnect physically people being together. We need to be together for sharing info, for uh, social relations. So we need, the creativity depends on the, the exchange, open conversation. So today we need to find the balance, the right balance between home working and office working. Too much of home working like in the States and they will come back. There is a backtracking in the United States to say full home working will not function. So we need to get people back to the office. In Europe, it's meet meet two, three days a week at office. In Asia and in Vietnam, it's mainly everybody back to the office. I think you have a clear, clear advantage because getting all people together will probably help you to accelerate the sharing, the, the feedback, the creativity, because people working together, physically together, they really go faster than people working online. So that's why Vietnam is really... So, so what, what is that? Is that a sense of collaboration, a sense of energy, let's say? You know, I, I read a bit more on your materials. You talked a lot more about that. Energy. Yeah. Individual energy, team's energy, organization energy. So remote working is killing that positive energy. Is it? Is it? Yeah, totally. I think today that Vietnam, in Vietnam, you have more natural innate energy than in other regions. People are, there is the willingness to succeed, the ambition to create something. Entrepreneurship is well developed here. In Europe, people are more in a more mature market where uh, uh, they can easily find new jobs and new businesses. I see there that we need really to motivate people to work or to go at the office. In Vietnam, the energy is there, it's natural. So you, you just have to canalize the energy in the right direction, in the right goal. In other regions, we have to create that energy, create the motivation, create the sense, give the purpose. Here, everything is there in-house. You have all pieces of the puzzle, but it's a little bit chaotic. How to better manage the pieces of the puzzle, right. how to set the goal, how to set the frame, how to create the trust. So what I bring here is more structure. Oh, the energy is there. I help you how to use better your energy and not disperse the energy. It's all about orienting, orientating the energy. In Vietnam, in recent years, there's, there's some attention to uh, the business, uh, the brought up for coaching for the business community. It's hard to find really talented leaders here. And because of the slew of these groups of leaders that self-made, create successful businesses. Not many that I met and interviewed, they believe much into getting experts from outside and coming in and teaching us what to do and telling us what to do. Could you talk more about that? Have you experienced uh, leaders in Vietnam that you struggle with encouraging and, and convincing them on the idea of coaching versus training? I think that in Vietnam, uh, we really need to to educate the market and uh, the, the different organization that training is not coaching. Training is you bring external, outside in. We bring from outside some internal, some internal knowledge methodologies. That's training. I teach you, I teach you, you play tennis, I teach you backhand, forehand, the technique. That's training. Coaching is more on the inner self, it's inside out. Training outside in, coaching inside out. What is your potential? And how can we really upload your genius to make your genius and your potential and your talent more effective? That's coaching. And that's new for Vietnam because you are used to use consultants 
consultants bring solutions, trainers may bring technology, coaches will come with questions, and questions mean that we will ask you the right question that help you to find your own solutions. It's just the opposite of mentoring. People confuse also mentoring and coaching. Mentoring, the mentor comes with his experience. His downloading is genius. Coaching is the opposite. It's uploading your genius. Mm. How can we detect your magic, your talent, your genius, and how to express it in a more efficient way? That's coaching. And I think that in Vietnam there is a huge potential because you made a lot of use of external content, consulting, training. I think that now we have to focus on you, your inner, your inner self, your values, your, uh, your magic, and how can we detect your magic and make that magic more impacting. That's coaching. No, I, th I think it's quite interesting because, like, thanks for, for those insights. Many people, they don't know the difference, even myself, when I talked about, like, the idea of, of mentoring versus coaching is quite interesting. Forbes in Vietnam, we did this uh, uh, issue this month on family business, passing the baton. We talked about the different mindset and different leaderships from the parents' generation to the next generation. So we have this group of uh, leaders today, uh, companies like uh, uh, Vin Group, Tech and Bank, um, other billionaires and large conglomerates here in Vietnam are led by the people in, in, in post-war area. And then there's a time that in the next seven to 10 years, they will be looking for successors. But this group of successors, we have met quite a few. They have different mindset, different leadership styles, different perspective. And uh, the way they looked at it, I look at it uh, at Forbes, we looked at it, is they will be the one who defining the economy and how the next generation work together. In your experience working here for the last eight years, almost 10 years, uh, could you tell the difference uh, when you see these people and what, what's it like for you? Yeah, and I see that in Vietnam, um, there, are, there is much more family business than in other countries. Much more. I was really impressed by the quantity of uh, business owners here compared to private equity companies in other regions. So here, uh, entrepreneurship is really something that is uh, very effective and very efficient. First, the advantage of family business is, uh, is uh, value-driven, uh, strong social values, better economic stability because they have that long-term view. So I see more stability in family business than in private equity business because stability in management also, in leadership. The challenge for family business is mainly the emotional engagement of the leaders that makes that uh, they uh, sometimes they keep uh, some people uh, in the management that are no more really efficient but because of the relationship we maintain those people on board which is dangerous because uh, don't, when you the flow is going fast even a dead fish can go with the flow so sometimes you have to clean the flow and say maybe those people did help me to form the company to create a company but if we want to go to the next next challenge, next Olympic Games, I will take, I will select performing players. And what you did yesterday is maybe not what we need tomorrow. So you need to be more selective. In family business, we are too much conservative. We keep the, the same mindset and we keep the same people. The second danger in family business is the capacity to delegate. As you mentioned, those people are not professional managers and delegation is key to cascade. And in, I see that usually in family business, they all look at the, the owner, the founder, to ask for permissions. Can you imagine in sport, my players, you receive the ball, you are a soccer player, you receive the ball, <laughs> and you have to look at the coach asking your permission to make a dribble or to make a shoot and, or to make a pass. So I think that clearly can slow down the process. The process of decision must be accelerated in family business. And the lack of delegation, capacity to delegate, a too many, too much in emotional connection can really be damaging for the future. About successors, it's key that we prepare the successors up front. So expose them. Expose them to real business cases in the company in some key functions. And you will see what is their style. And, and if there are many successors, you can propose different functions. And then you select the guys who feel more engaged in the company. So I think that for a successor today, to be successful, we need really to engage and to prepare before that they, they, they get on board. 
before it's less pressure in a more calm environment so you can prepare the successor you can train the successor but you can also coach the successor train leadership skills leadership techniques coach what is your leadership style your own leadership style that makes your difference uh, compared to your father or your uh, uncles makes that you will lead the company with your own style and that's coaching helping you to detect your magic your talent and what makes that you will bring that added value the big difference between family business and private equity is that the compass guiding private equity is profit the compass guiding family business is legacy transmission continuation and that's really the key element leading by purpose so the successor we have to check that do they have the same purpose the same level of ambition do they share the values if we can really check that then we can really engage the successor in the successor plan it's quite interesting when you look at that from a certain angle family business in vietnam the successful ones that account for about 25 percent of gdp in vietnam you said you've seen more family business in Vietnam than any countries. 25%. Yes, 25% of our GDP. Only 100 companies in Vietnam that make up 25% of the wow. GDP. Those families, the successful companies that I've seen, they're sending their successors to get education from top-notch schools, right? They're armed with quite amazing knowledge. Vietnam is a fast-changing country. Dynamic economy. So then these people coming back. What do you think of that knowledge would do for this country versus the practical experience that these parents have witnessed the evolution of the, the, the whole country in the, in the last 20 years? You're right, and uh, probably that external, international experience, we can call that training, learning. So we acquire marketing skills, finance skills, technical skills. And uh, coming back to, to the country, to Vietnam, we need more coaching to see what can I do with that external knowledge to implement it in my entity, my company, my country. And there I have to adapt my style to the needs of the company, to the needs of the country. And it's there that coaching is useful because coaching is really detecting what is your style and how can you fit your style with your company, with the, the owners of the company. And it's there that you really create the, the link. I think training is useful to feed the brain. Coaching is more to integrate the individual in the company, in the society. Asking you what is really your, uh, what is your, what is your major objective, your ambition, uh, what, are you, what gives you energy. Talent is always close to energy. We refer to energy. You look at your agenda, one week agenda of uh, Kuang, and you look at what are the tasks that are energizing me. And what are the tasks that are consuming my energy? Tasks that are energizing you are close to your talent. Talent gives energy. Competences acquired consume energy. So today we have one hour interview. One key moment. Is that energizing you or consuming your energy? Super energetic. Super energized. It means that that's close to your talent. That capacity to, uh, to connect, to uh, interview, to discuss, to talk. Relationship is really something that you have in you. That's your magic. Beside that, we need to accept to do tasks which are less in your magic, in your talent, which means maybe some administrative tasks. So the coaching part helps you to better detect what I like to do and beside compare to what I can do. What I like to do gives me energy, pleasure, fun. What I like to do, what I can do, consume my energy and efforts. And there you can really find your best way to fit into the company. So that's all about coaching. Today, I think that successors could really benefit from more one-on-one -on -one coaching to really detect their innate talent, not just get that international experience, external, outside in, but that inside out. The inside out is really what is my personality, my willingness, my nature, and my, my objective. And there you can make the difference. So to, to a certain extent that you allow to share on the type of clients that you train and coached here, Let's talk about some interesting, fun stories or impactful coaching session with local businesses. So I, I here I manage uh, the private equity companies, uh, multinationals like uh, Heineken that I mentioned earlier. Yes, uh, that's one style. Usually, uh, the multinational is composed of a mix of 
local managers, Vietnamese managers and expatriates. So the, the challenge for the coach is really how to glue different culture. That's the mm -hmm. main challenge. For local companies, usually they are more managed with Vietnamese people, local people, where they all have the same culture. The problem of the Vietnamese culture is too much respect for the hierarchy and lack of feedback. Mm. Feedback is food for champions. If we want to grow, we need feedback. Training, if we analyze how do we grow people, 10% of you grow come from training, new skills, new uh, competences. 20% of you grow come from sharing, sharing with other industries, sharing with other CEO talks, sharing with other managers. Sharing gives you 20% of you grow. 10% training, 20% sharing. 70% is on the job learning, debriefing, feedback, coaching makes you grow on the job. So the more we get feedback, the more we get debrief, the more we, we are on the job, the more we can grow. So today the challenge in Vietnam is we need to create a feedback culture. Hmm. Here we don't challenge our colleagues, we don't challenge the boss. So today I see that we see the missing piece of the puzzle is really a culture of feedback, open feedback, transparent feedback. Challenge your colleagues. You have high expectations, you have a high level of ambition. Challenge your colleagues, give them recognition when they deserve, and give them challenging feedback is when that, they deserve. Is that, a, is that a common thing for a human to avoid confrontation? Is providing feedback is sometimes misunderstood as being confronted? Yes, but I think in Vietnam it's more cultural. In Europe, uh, open feedback, challenging the, the colleagues, it's quite normal. Here in Vietnam, even between pair, peers, we don't challenge each other. In America, in the United States, it's quite no problem to challenge the boss, to challenge the colleagues. In Europe, we don't challenge the boss, but we challenge the colleagues. In Vietnam, we don't challenge the colleagues and we don't challenge the boss. <laughs> so it's there that you really have to create that feedback culture. But also the boss needs to accept that he needs also feedback from the peers and from the teams to also improve his leadership style. So I think that for me, the main focus for Vietnam could be creating a feedback culture. The energy is there, but the culture stops the capacity to learn and 70% of your growth comes from feedback. So we need to create that feedback culture. You are a world-renowned coach, a top one. You also need a coach. <coughs> yeah. I assume you had a coach. Yes. Did you, you talk about that experience before? Yes, we all need that external perspective. We, we, all, need, we all need to get out of... If you stay too much, it's like the hamster in the wheel. We are very active, but the hamster in the wheel makes that with more pressure, we spin the wheel faster, <laughs> but we never get out of the wheel. Right. So we need really somebody who did give us that external perspective on our own way of doing. So I have a coach. I have a coach which is a, a French lady in France and I have regular meeting with her talking about my challenges, my ambition, my problems. And so we talk and that helps me. She doesn't bring me any solution. But the fact that she asked the right question helped me, helped me to find my solutions. And that's coaching. Coming to many different organizations, is age an important factor um, as a coach? It's not a question of age, it's a question of experience. Uh, experience means that you have minimum 10, 15, 20 years of practice uh, in sports, if you are a sports coach, in business, if you are a business coach. You cannot coach, you cannot, you cannot coach without experience. Coaching is a second, second generation job. You, most of the coaches are between 40, 45, 50. And then you can coach people below 40. I'm 60 plus, so I can coach very senior managers. Yes, it's not a question of age, it's a question of experience. I see people who have 60, 65, 70 years, but they don't have really experience. What means experience? It means that you transform a lift event into learnings. Many people today, we have, today we have one hour talk. That's a talk, that's an event. How to transform the talk into an experience because of feedback, debrief, analysis, self-reflection. An event is just a happening. How to transform happening into learning. After the event, we debrief, we learn, we feedback. And there we grow. Many people don't take the time to reflect. 
So they have many happenings. They never have any learnings. Transforming happening in learning, that's called experience. Don't confuse a happening and a learning. My best friend got married for the first time 40 years ago. Beautiful wedding, beautiful happening. I was his best man, I make a speech. Two years later, he divorced. He got married a second time. Super wedding, super happening. I'm the, the best man, I make another speech. Two years later, he divorced again. So he got married one time, two times, three times, four times. Super weddings, super happenings, zero learnings. <laughs> Don't confuse happening and learning. So it's not a question of age. You can be 60 with a lot of happenings, but no learnings. But you can also be 20 with many happenings, less happenings, but a lot of learnings. It's a question of how do you transform happenings into learnings? How do you transform event into experience? And there we need a coach. So it's take time to, to be intentional and to reflect. Otherwise, there's no learning. Yeah. Okay. That's all the concept yeah. of time out. Take the time, pit stop, time out, one minute, five minutes to reflect. After our talk, reflection. What went well? What went wrong? How can we improve for the next time? And there we need that moment of reflection. And we need that external support that helps us to reflect on ourselves. And there we transform every event into experience. And with a lot of experience, you become a better manager. Right. And a, a better human being. And a better human being. Yes, yes, absolutely. Because we are easily being dragged into the flow of things, especially in, in a uh, highly dynamic and ever-changing environment like Ho Chi Minh City or Vietnam. It's, it's fast-moving. It's, it's yeah. easy for them to be uh, lost and not reflect and learn. Yes, that's, that's quite interesting. In, in that's the moment that we get the hamster out of the wheel. Yeah. Many managers in Vietnam are in the, like hamsters in the wheel, spinning the wheel, pressure, stress, intensity, speed, how to get people out of the wheel. And that's the concept of time out. And their coaching helps you to reflect during one hour, half a day, to reflect on yourself to see what more can I improve. In Formula One, there is pit stop. In basketball, we have time out. That's the moment of reflection that makes that you become better because of that moment of self-analysis and reflection. Do so you still talk to the friend that got married four, four times? <laughs> He's still my friend, but I cannot coach him because it's my best friend. And so I'm emotionally connected. And you cannot coach your wife, you cannot coach your kids, you cannot coach your husband. It's impossible because there is too much intensity in connection. Mm. And that makes the, the, the challenge for family business. Because of that emotional engagement makes that we, are, we lose objectivity. We become subjective. The weight of the past is there. So it's there that we really need that external support to be more objective, to reflect on the reality and not just on emotions. That's quite insightful, yes. yes. Many people don't see that. Like, okay, we cannot apply the same principle to family relationship because yes. we're emotionally attached. Because of the intensity of the emotions, because of the weight of the history of the family. Yeah. So we, that's where we need that external view. Not a trainer, not a consultant, a coach that helps us to reflect, to see the real reality. And not subjective. the perception, not the subjective reality. Yeah. I represent a part of the group of uh, what we talked earlier was uh, talking about the successors uh, who are inheriting what this country has given to us from an economic perspective. Uh, I can go out and, and build businesses, but I'm still learning from a lot of people. What's your advice on my generation that you've seen this country is growing in a certain speed? What's your advice in terms of leaderships or, 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 or management or, or working with people? My advice is that today, in our generation, 40, 45, 50, we need to adapt to the needs of the next generation. You have kids, you have adolescents. Try to tell and to impose something to your kids today and mm. you will see the reaction. What was not the past 20 years ago when we were really respecting our parents today, that concept of respect is completely renewed. So we need as leaders to adapt to the needs of their needs. They will be the future. So I need to accept with humility to listen, to connect to their needs, to accept that this is the future. So we need to adapt. We need really to be flexible and agile mentally. And the problem of some uh, family owners is that they don't listen sufficiently to the needs of the successors. And they want to continue the same leadership style. Coaching many family business today, I know that 
humility, openness, and letting the successor make it his own way, with his own talent, or his own magic, is, that's really the challenge. Mm. So my recommendation, be humble, listen, be agile, be open, be transparent, to say that, okay, guys, what do you need to make this transmission a success? And you have to adapt to your kids, you have to adapt to your successors. That's the, the name of the game. Well, it's been wonderful to meet and chat with you today. Thank you for uh, being here. Thank you. <laughs> it was a nice, thank you. Nice moment.